You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television, for you, by you. Hi, I'm Althea Resendria from Life on Gabriela TV. I recently did a couple interviews talking about the film Seagrass, directed and written by Meredith Hema Brown. Seagrass is a multi-layered drama film that touches on topics including motherhood, grief, intergenerational trauma, racial identity, and how everything is connected to the concept of fear. The film received many awards from various film festivals and was released in theaters for a limited time. But for those who are interested in seeing the film, Seagrass will be available on video on demand starting April 2nd in Canada and in the US. Now, this video will be divided into two parts. The first being an in-depth interview about the film with Meredith herself. And the second one is an interview I did with Morek Ruffman at the Haven on Gabriela Island, which is also the predominant location for the film. What was their experience like having the film produced at the Haven with the involvement of the Gabriela Island community? We'll get more into it later on in the video, but for now, here's my interview with Meredith Hema Brown. Meredith, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so let's just dive right into it now. Seagrass, yeah, for debut feature film. It has won multiple awards and nominations. Congratulations. How are you feeling right now? Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm so excited. Uh, it's just been such a, a beautiful, you know, way to have the film out in the world. And it's just been wonderful sharing it with audiences. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean to you to like witness the transformation of your work from paper to the big screen? It's very moving. It's it's it just starts as this little seed of an idea <laughs> or it did just start as this little seed of an idea in my head. And then, you know, to have everyone get involved, who got involved and then to see how they furthered this this tiny seed and helped it to become what it was uh, is just very a special feeling for sure. Mm -hmm. It's huge. And you did an amazing job for sure. <laughs> and let's go back quite a bit to the start of your journey. You know, you've been in this industry for many years now. Mm -hmm. What got you into filmmaking in the first place? Um, I would say in, in a lot of ways, uh, going to film school, I think that I always um, loved the idea of being in a profession that was creative. I think I've always had a natural uh you know storytelling uh side to me even since i was young but really maybe i didn't really see film as a career until i moved to vancouver and then being in university and getting into the film program i was able to just explore the different facets of that and that's where i really started to realize like okay this is this is for me long term and did the place you grew up in influence your decision or support your interest in filmmaking? Because you, you had to move to Vancouver um, like to kind of further and polish this mm -hmm. like skills that you have. What was it like before you moved? Uh, I would say that probably it didn't really influence that decision only because, um, you know, there's obviously a much bigger film scene in Vancouver than there is on Vancouver Island, although there there is one there as well. But... Um, I think just growing up, I didn't realize that it was an option, like I said. So I think it it was definitely something that I would say came a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so do you think that like you found the resources that you were looking for um, to like really discover your passion, uh, like, you know, in Vancouver, maybe make, with like more options? Is that maybe what you think? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think that finding community is one of the most important resources in a way. Like, I think it's when people, I mean, probably in many different professions, but I know in film, it takes so many people to come together to make it happen that community is especially important. And so I think finding community, um, whether it was in film school or afterwards, really just allows that that journey to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the film Seagrass, it was shot on Gabriela Island. And yes. I believe that was that was an excellent choice. <laughs> With all the stunning sceneries, I think that's a really good one. And as the story writer and director, why did you choose to shoot the film on Gabriela Island? Yeah, so the film is set on a fictional island off the coast of BC, uh, but we did shoot predominantly on Gabriola Island and a few days in Tofino and Euclid as well for some of the exterior scenes. 
Um, and really the choice was just looking around a year before shooting myself and the director of photography. Normally we went searching for different, um, you know, natural scenery locations, but also retreat areas. And in the end we found the Haven and it, just with timing of when we wanted to shoot and the natural beauty of Gabriola and Haven, I just, it just was absolutely the right fit. And so I was so excited and it was such a beautiful experience as well. I will say shooting on Gabriel, I know for the whole team, the cast and crew, everyone just loved it there and felt so welcomed by the community. So it was a re very nice experience to shoot there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As you're like growing up, did you spend a lot of time on Gabriel Island? I spent a little bit of time on Gabriola. Um, definitely did some trips there and, um, you know, I, I haven't gone to all of the small Gulf Islands, but the Gabriel I have. Mm, and you mentioned about like having the crew and the you know, entire cast there and just having a good time. It, what was the journey like to, you know, because uh, I know you had to take a ferry. So that and what was the experience like for them? Did you, they talk like mention, comment, anything about like the travel over you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. I think it was kind of exciting for everyone. It feels really nice, I think, to get away as a team and to like be there with everyone, eating meals with everyone. And I think it really does create like just a nice bonding experience for everyone. And it it was it's just so beautiful there. But I think a lot of people just had a lot of fun and it felt like a bit of a getaway. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> You you would recommend this location to other filmmakers? Absolutely, yeah. It's it's the most welcoming uh, island that you could possibly think of. So, nice. <laughs> so let's talk about the film Seagrass. What was your biggest inspiration or motivation behind creating? Yeah, um, I would say that at the heart of Seagrass, I wanted to tell a story that on the outside looks at the potential um, crumbling of a family, but really at the heart of it is what is happening for the characters internally. And that's definitely that something that I was much more fascinated with were the questions around, you know, how people are feeling in their internal foundations. So really that was the anchor point for me is this idea of fear and uncertainty in our lives. And from there, many different um, themes and I would say three predominant storylines emerged and yeah, I just kind of kept coming back to that and keeping that as, as the part that would keep it together for me. And when it comes to life, there's so many uncertainties and different aspects. Everyone can experience things differently. And, mm -hmm. you know, as a Japanese Canadian, did you find your historical and like cultural background impacted how you wrote or approached the story? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely think so, because I will say that it's it's not just, um, well, first of all, I will say that in general, this is very much a fictional story with fictional characters, and um, the events of the story, as well as the characters, are 100% fiction. Um, you know, I, I didn't, although my parents did get divorced, I definitely had a very different experience with uh, their they're divorced. They, I never saw them argue. They were probably the most uh, responsible divorce I've ever <laughs> witnessed. So, you know, a lot of it is fictional, including questions around identity as well. Um, but I would say in a lot of ways that is drawing from some, some of my own experiences, at least the Japanese Canadian part in terms of, you know, not even so much my own experiences, but what I know is like a common thread for Japanese Canadians. So, you know, in the Japanese Canadian community, for example, there's been so much loss of culture and personal family history because the incarceration of Japanese Canadians in the 1940s really fractured communities to the point where language was lost um, because everyone was dispersed throughout the country. And even after the war, no one was allowed to return to their previous communities. They'd been dispossessed. And so, you know, that is what I'm really looking at in terms of Japanese Canadian um, identity. And I think that's also why the character of Pat played by Chris Pang, it was essential that he was Chinese Australian because 
I wanted to show how they have two differing perspectives in their Asian identity, because this really is something that is very specific to Japanese Canadian identity mm-hmm. and American in, in, yeah. in so many ways. Yeah. And with all those kind of factors and things that you really have to think about, did you have any worries or concerns as you were writing the script? Of course. I mean, I think there's just a huge sense of responsibility tackling subjects like this. And, you know, I definitely felt that and just wanted to make sure that I was portraying everything in a way that that would honor um, the kind of truth of of what has happened in the Japanese, Canadian and American um, communities. Mm -hmm. And throughout the production of the film, did you get to learn or relearn anything new about your identity? Um, like in terms of my Japanese Canadian identity or other or more kind of uh, generally? In general, yes. Yeah, in general, I guess I would say that in many ways, every time I I work on something, (laughs) I do that because I do feel like, you know, writing especially is such um, a process where you're just you're just delving into so many things that you think about naturally and so I think that there's always so much learning and and relearning that is that is going on. Um, at least people who are writing about themes that are meaningful to them, I imagine that is that is often the case. And I for sure identify with that. And as a story writer, it can be challenging to create characters that are different from one another and not just different versions of the same person. How did you decide on each character's identity, making sure they have their own individuality? Yeah, I think a lot of that comes from the story and their choices within the story. Uh, You know, I I think that there's there's definitely three very distinct um, characters within the three predominant female characters. I think that Emmy is going through a bit of an existential crisis, even at a young age, and she's encountering these really big questions around life and death and you know the past and I think an attachment and so I think she's she's really going through these big questions and her actions are based around that and how she navigates that and then um the the middle-aged character Stephanie who's 11 uh she is seeking a sense of belonging and I think that that is at the core of what she wants and so for me as I was making decisions about who she is, I knew that that would be at the forefront of what identifies her. And Judith, the mother of the two daughters, is going through something completely different, which is that I think that she's not feeling seen in many ways in her marriage, not just in the fact that her husband isn't seen, you know, her adequately in terms of her racial identity, but also he's not seen and understanding her other needs as well. Um, but I think she's really trying to overcome that and push through it in in so many ways. And so I think that it's it's really kind of what they were all going through that creates their identity um, over over the course of writing. And speaking about that, you have a or like a remarkable group of cast. They did an amazing job portraying the characters. I was totally convinced they were actual people, not fictional, even though they are fictional, right. And- <laughs> you, you got Ali, uh, Ali Maki as Judith, Luke Roberts as Steve, Chris Pang as Pat, and Sarah Gadot as Carol, and also the girls, Diane Remy as like Stephanie and Emmy. Yeah. Can you tell me about your experience working with the cast, like all you know, the adults and also the girls? Yeah, they were all so wonderful. Um, I love the cast so much. They just brought so much to this project and, you know, so much of of you know, who the characters become is because of them and their insight and and how they portrayed all of those characters. And I think that they were just so perfectly cast by the casting directors, Jenny Ju and the Canadian casting directors, Chris Waz and Kara Eide. So I just felt very fortunate to be surrounded by that support in finding the right people. And then once I found them, having all of the support uh, from all of them. And they all were fantastic. They all work differently. And so a lot of you know, working with, with them was just kind of figuring out what what was helpful for them as a director. And since the adults played polar opposite couples, yet 
found yourself in the, uh, in the same place, the, develop, the self-development retreat. What is your preferred method of directing the cast in order for them to achieve the desired character portrayal? Hmm. I think it's really different for every single person. And I try my best as a director to really just think about what someone needs most in any moment um, and to create a supportive environment for them. And it always is different, like different different actors need different things. Some actors really want to dig in and discuss things in depth. Other actors uh, might not want to do that at all. And I think just kind of reading what works for them and what they prefer creates the best environment for them to be comfortable and creative. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's all over the map. <laughs> in, in terms of communication, did you face any conflict during that? In terms of communication with the actors? Oh, no. Like, it was so, so lovely. They were all so collaborative. Um, and, yeah, I was just very, very grateful for how collaborative they were. They made it very easy for me. Mm, oh, that's really good to hear. How did you find your suitable communication style? Because you, you've been with you've been in this for like quite some time, and you pl- take on like multiple lo- roles. How did you find your way to communicate as a director? Because it might be different to like um, you know as like an actor or like a writer. So how did you do it? Um, I guess I would just say it's the same as. I mean, yeah, it is. It is different than you know when I'm writing. I don't really have to communicate <laughs> too much because. I'm just communicating with myself, but um, no, I think uh, communication is is so important in film, especially as a director. And I think it's always a goal to just truly try to listen to people and be respectful and, um, you know, be clear about, you know, what you're hoping to achieve and to, yeah, just, I don't know, I guess I, I, did, I haven't really thought too much exactly about the communication style, but I would say it, it's something that kind of has developed organically over the years. And, you know, Naya and Remy, I think, played such a convincing sister duo. I, myself, am a younger sister. My, my sister is uh, four years older than me, Aww. and we spent most of our childhood together playing, fighting, bantering, arguing over small things. Yeah. And sometimes you wouldn't be able to understand what we're doing or why we're doing them because it's only something that the two of us sisters could understand. Why? <laughs> Did the girls require any particular briefing or workshop to achieve what we see in the final cut? Yeah, we... So I don't know if they necessarily required it, but this is what we, we did because they were excellent and they just were so so uh organic and intuitive and honestly they they were just wonderful right from the get-go but what we did do was uh we only had a few days to rehearse by the time we cast them because it all unfortunately came together so last minute which was stressful but once we finally found these two incredible girls to play the sisters um we i got them together for a rehearsal and within five minutes they already seemed just like sisters (laughs) It was so sweet. You could just see the the compatibility and chemistry between them. And a lot of rehearsing, like we would do a little bit of actual rehearsing of the scenes, but I didn't want to overwork the material. I didn't want it to get like boring for them. And so we do a little bit of that when we rehearse, but we also just play like theater games or improv games and just things like that to get to know each other better. And I feel like that was really useful. And then We'd sprinkle in a little bit of scene work as well. Um, yeah, just just throughout. Did you do any of those kind of exercise also to get the chemistry with, um, with like, did you do that with, with Ellie Maki, with the girls? Or was it like... Uh, I wish that we could have, uh, but unfortunately, and Ellie's, Ellie's said this in interviews, so I think it's fine to say, but she actually got COVID right before we oh. shot. So... Although I really wanted some substantial time to work with Ali before going to set, I didn't have any. <laughs> and she didn't have any time to rehearse with the kids. I actually got the most time working with Luke Roberts, who's probably the person I needed to work with the least because, you know, I think Judith's character is so central. And of course, I really wanted some good time with the kids because they're so young. But in the end, I got a ton of time working with Luke. 
And then, you know, a bit of time working with Luke and the girls. And then, yeah, Allie just kind of had to dive into it once she recuperated. But she's she said before, I think this is very true, it kind of worked towards the character because I think Judith is feeling really isolated within her family. And so she was really able to dive in and just embrace that. And I think it it worked super well for what her character is going through. Mm, yeah, I can agree. <laughs> <laughs> and the film itself has again you touched on the problem like in intergenerational trauma and then there's uh, the bond between like later the between the sisters and the motherhood about family and everything somehow kind of connected into this idea of like fear and everyone has different kind of fears they have different focus mm-hmm. but uncertainty and mm-hmm. out of all of the characters whose fear can you relate the most to I would say I relate to all of the characters' fears very much because I don't think I'd be able to write this as effectively if it were imbalanced. And, you know, all of the fears that they're going through are pretty um, so universal in some ways because I think many people, not just six-year-olds, have this fear of the unknown and of, of death and they, you know, fears around, um, you know, losing what they have. And I think everyone has fears, not everyone, but most people have fears around belonging. So many people have fears about, did they make the right decision in life? Are they living the life that they want to be living? So, you know, I think that all of these themes and fears are um, quite universal. And in order to really like engage with the characters and move, move their characters through the different drafts, I really had to find my connection point to them as well. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Because even... Fear itself cannot really be just like pinpoint to one thing. There's just so many, and sometimes they overlap. I totally, <laughs> absolutely. And speaking about fear, the cave in the film is a crucial element to the story. Was the cave always the symbol or part of the concept from the story? It was. Yeah, it was something that um, right from the very beginning. It was in the first draft, and I think it it evolved over time. And, you know, took on deeper meaning as as the drafts progress, the many, many drafts. But um, it was in the very first one, which is really cool. And I think, you know, we talked about the anchor point of uncertainty. And I think in many ways, the cave is a symbolic anchor point to the story. It was for me. I knew like it, it was something that right from the beginning, I was like, this this cave isn't going anywhere um, because I think it is so symbolic and interconnected with the central anchor point of fear because it is about these kind of things that we don't understand in our lives it's about the past and what haunts us it's about everything that we can't make sense of and I think that is uh definitely crucial to the film so I'm glad I found it early (laughs) Mm -hmm. oh yeah that's the that's the best decision (laughs) to keep it (laughs) It, even I noticed that the shots from the children's like point of view are handheld what, yeah. like and as you mentioned in the note is to to show that they're in a different world and it's chaotic it's different mm-hmm. and i also noticed especially the shot where um emmy was walking towards the cave the cameras are held at like their eye level at mm-hmm. least like for most of um emmy's perspective i think her steps are usually a bit wide or slightly a bit more spacious you could see a little bit more of her surrounding maybe because she puts herself out there i think that's probably how i see it but in general i think it's also because they're at the age where they're still learning and observing the world around them and i think the adults have already established some kind of position at their age where they're no longer perceiving the world from their eyes but based it off their environment i think that's just like how we survive in the real world too was that something you wanted the viewer to recognize yeah that's a really great observation that um between the handheld camera between Emmy and Stephanie and how it differs. And um, yeah, I think in many ways that probably was somewhat intuitive. Like, of course, the handheld camera was very intentional for the children in the sense that we knew that we wanted to be swept up in the kids' journeys and in a more subjective viewpoint than the adults, which we shot in this more controlled or static or controlled camera moves and like definitely wider than the kids to sort of show this um, this feeling of staleness and this kind of lack of 
joy and the sense of isolation in, in their world and in their relationship. But the observation about being more eye level with Emmy and like even more with her, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, Emmy is going through a very solitary process, whereas Stephanie is going through a story of belonging. And so I think naturally the camera wanted to include more people because that's really how she is approaching the world where it's almost like Emmy is just caught in this bubble all by herself and she doesn't know how to break out of it. So I think in many ways that that choice was probably guided by the intuition of, you know, the cinematographer Norm Lee and myself, just as we were deciding on shots, I think that probably we were we were wanting to to like feel that in some way. I'm just gonna say I think always from the beginning I I've, I I saw Emmy as the heart of this story, like the nucleus almost, because a lot of what is happening in her family and and everything it trickles down to her and it goes through her sister and eventually ends up kind of weighing on her. So. Although she's not necessarily the sole protagonist, I think because she's the heart and nucleus of the story, there is like that closeness that I think I I felt like, you know, maybe I wanted to to really find with her. Yeah. And it, I I can see how it goes, especially because what is she's somehow also drawn into the cave. She's so drawn into ca the cave. And even when I see like, you know, in the trailer that she's like in the middle and that gives, you know, often reference back to like that soul. I was thinking about grandma and then grandma's bag. So it's like she's somehow, you know, unintentionally or intentionally, like always like the center of what's like the surrounding. Yeah, I think 100%. It's definitely, I think there's this sense with Emmy in the cave that it's, it's drawing her in, in a certain way, or that there's this magnetic presence to it. And I think what that represents is really just her need for understanding at this time in her life where there's so little understanding. I, you know, I actually found the, the children, like the girls, somewhat resemble the parents' behaviors or reactions. Mm -hmm. Like it, It's as if they're like mini versions, but not the exact duplicates. Like Emmy is more um, like observant and like more cautious, like kind of similar to Judith, at least from the reactions. And um, Steph is more similar to to Steve and also mm -hmm. based on um, how they kind of interact and it's really easy to see how they bounce off each other mm -hmm. there's that one scene where it it really see it really shows that like Steve really knew how to like cheer her up mm -hmm. um, in that one scene and it just looked like yeah father and daughter that's like the yeah. like, connection right there was that intentional yeah I definitely wanted um uh you know, for there to be dynamics in the film that we pick up on. And I think every family has dynamics. And um, so, yeah, it, it definitely was uh, intentional to have those those dynamics. And I knew from the beginning that, you know, just when Stephanie's character is really needing her mom and needing her mom's guidance, I think she's finding that her mom and her are finding conflict and you know, not quite understanding each other either. And a lot of responsibility is falling on Stephanie um, as a result of what's happening between her parents. So I definitely saw that as being one of the early dynamics. And then Steve, of course, being full of so many flaws and some of them, you know, really some of the least forgiving flaws in the, in the film, probably. I did want, you know, the side of him that we understand to be his connection with his kids. And so having scenes like that where he's just interacting with his kids and making them laugh and, and everything, I knew that that would be um, an important part to his character as well. Oh, yeah. And we can definitely see that. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the movie is not set in the, like this year. You know, it's not uh, it's set in the 90s, uh, you know, with different view physically and mentally and we can see that kind of like hinting throughout the movie mm -hmm. and what were the steps that you had to take to achieve that essence of nostalgia during the shoot and post-production so during the shoot it was really collaborative uh i was working with an incredible team uh the production designer louisa birkin uh did an incredible job as did the costume designer athena thenny and 
hair and makeup artist Isabel Paganine. Um, so, you know, working with these uh, head of departments, they they were really great at coming up with ideas to create that nostalgia. And it was just really wonderful talking to them about, you know, what I was seeing for it and then having them add additional ideas to that and having that back and forth was such a, an exciting part of the creative process. And a lot of it was just lots of back and forth, sending ideas, um, you know, discussing why we do or don't gravitate towards certain things. Um, so yeah, that that part of the film was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It definitely achieved the sense of nostalgia. That's for sure. It felt so <laughs> weird. Like, wow. And of course, we also shot this on 35 millimeter film. So I think that also naturally adds um, that kind of nostalgic feeling to the way it was shot as well. Mm -hmm. Honestly, that, that's definitely like a, a great creative like, a decision to shot it. <laughs> and you've done numerous of works in the past, but Seagrass is your first uh, full length like feature film. Do you think those like past projects, they shaped how you decide on the techniques and style choices you implemented in Seagrass? I would say yes and no. Um, I think that with every project I've done, of course, I'm always learning about, you know, what I like and deepening sort of my voice as a director in, in some ways. But also whenever I approach a new project, I don't really think about it in that way. I kind of just think of the project like, okay, this is its own thing. And what excites me about it? What, what kind of things do I want to do with this? Um, so yeah, I'm always kind of I think every project definitely starts from scratch, but of course I have knowledge to draw from, from my previous work. Yeah. By any chance, were there any scenes in Seagrass that didn't end up making the final cut? Oh yeah, there were, there were a few. Um, you know, a lot of them did make it in, but there were definitely a few. One that I get asked about a lot uh, because I get asked about the title a lot. And the title actually came from a deleted scene. Um, <laughs> so whenever I get asked, why is it called Seagrass? I talk about this deleted scene. And the deleted scene is that near, kind of near the end of the film-ish, or like near the climax, the two sisters are talking about the nature of fear because Stephanie is noticing that Emmy is feeling afraid. And Stephanie tells her the story of how she used to be afraid of swimming through seagrass because it's kind of an icky feeling and she was afraid that something would come out of the water to grab her ankle. And, you know, she got over her fear and she just swam right through it. And I decided to get rid of that scene because, you know, when you get into the edit, you just want to get rid of as much as, as possible because it's always great to tell the story in the most succinct way that, that feels right uh, tonally. So we did get rid of that. But the name stuck because I think it is such a beautiful uh metaphorical image for me I just picture seagrass at the bottom of the ocean swaying in the darkness and I think there's just something very mysterious and eerie and beautiful about it so the name the name stuck in the end but the scene got cut <laughs> <laughs> the, honestly yeah the title works because if it's just grass on its own you it's something that you see almost every single day it's yeah. outside it's familiar everyone's everyone just knows nothing scary mm -hmm. about that when it comes to seagrass, it's like, whoa, it's in, in the sea. It's like, what is exact, what exactly is seagrass? Or maybe like, you know, there might be some people that have never seen it before. You know, who, who knows? And that's, that works perfectly. <laughs> yeah. And it's not seaweed either, because seaweed doesn't have the same connotation, does it? It has a bit of like, you know, a different connotation. But seagrass, to me, feels like kind of a, a beautiful image as well as being a bit mysterious. Is that or always the original title from the start? No, I went through many and just, you know, it, it actually takes a while sometimes to find the right title. And I remember I'd just write on a page like all these terrible titles and like. <laughs> <laughs> well, we stuck with seagrass and that worked. Yes. <laughs> Now, the story wraps up in what you describe as um, the most enriching and truthful ending for a film. Now, without trying to spoil anything, how did you feel when you first put the ending together? Yeah, so 
I I think I probably said it felt like the most enriching. Um, I can't remember what you said. Enriching and, and, and truthful ending and truthful ending for this film in particular, um, because prior actually this does relate back to your previous question about deleted scenes. There were some other scenes at the end, but to me they felt like they were just adding clutter to the end of the film, and I really wanted to, you know. For me, it wasn't important in this film to wrap up every single thing. I think that the film is looking at a lot of complex questions and it would be overly simplistic to wrap up every single detail, including, you know, without giving anything away, I think that the parents' relationship, um, there's many different ways to look at the ending. But for me, it's not really about what just happens in the plot. For me, what is so much more important is the characters coming to a place of being the people who they need to be and, you know, being in the relationships that they're in, in the ways that they need to be. And that to me is the resolution. So once I found that, which again, it's hard to say this without giving anything away, but when people watch the film, they can, you know, think on it for themselves. But um, that was that was so much of, of what I found in the current ending was just like these re- relationships are resolved in and these characters have found the more, most important resolution that they need to find in this moment. And that is what mattered to me um, when when finding the end of the film. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think the tone and everything, they kind of like had a really great build up to the end. So I think that that definitely worked so well. <laughs> yeah. Well, now, what hopes do you have for people that are, uh, you know, watching this film? Uh, what what hopes for people that are curious to learn about the film? What do you what do you think about? Like, yeah, what are your hopes? For? I hope that people will find a sense of connection with the film. I think that there's many different things to connect with, um, whether people are Japanese Canadian or American or mixed race, but also people identify with this in many many other ways as well, such as, you know, I think there's lots of questions around motherhood and grief and complex family dynamics. Um, So really, I just hope that people will will leave the theater or leave their laptop saying, oh, I felt, you know, moved in some way or that caused me to think about questions in my own life or I feel really seen by the film. So, yeah, that's that's what I hope people will get. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're sort of still in the, like well the start of this year i guess <laughs> i don't know if you still consider it um but you you know you had this release um in theaters like in the film what are you currently looking forward to after you know this massive uh, achievement i think just getting back to the <laughs> the writing board the, the you know just getting back to writing and figuring out what what is next and starting to to work work on that mm-hmm. and definitely looking forward to that <laughs> curious <laughs> thank you so much mm-hmm. well you know i'm grateful to have this opportunity to interview you and i'm glad you made seagrass happen i think it's so it's important to raise awareness on the topic of lost history and culture and including other elements involving like you know the internal relationship and bonds within the family mm-hmm. i think uh, a lot of people, they might actually get, you know, specific lessons or even just information and see how other stories, again, even though it is fictional, a lot of people can definitely relate to it. it yeah, absolutely. And I feel, yeah, I feel like it has a great impact on almost all aspects of our life. It- oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. And yeah, uh, really lovely chatting. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. I'm excited to see what future voice. And <laughs> once again, congratulations on your achievements. Thank you. And now I present to you my interview with Warwick Ruckman at the Haven on Gabriela Island. Hi, I'm Althea Arsandria from Live on Gabriela TV. I'm here with Morag. We're at the Haven on Gabriela Island, which also a predominantly location for film Seagrass by Meredith Hema Brown. We'll be talking about what the film was like being filmed here and what it means. So thank you so much for being here today. You're welcome. Can you please introduce um, your background and your position at the Haven? Um, I'm the co-general manager here and I've worked here for over 25 years 
and um, have worked in a number of different positions over the years. Mm -hmm. And you've you've spent a lot of time working here. I can see it. <laughs> yes. Um, what is the Haven is for? What do people come here? Uh, the Haven offers programs for people who are looking to um, get more out of their life. So improve relationships, communication, uh, just be able to live more fully in their lives. Mm -hmm. And based on your experience, how much do you think it has contributed to the people on Gabriela and who, whoever decides to come here? Well, it's very much a um, life changing the programs for people. Um, we have people who are still referring family and friends 20 years after they've been here themselves for even just one program. So I think that speaks for itself. We're really built on word of mouth and the impact. It's, you know, words like transformational, life changing, as I said, um, and I think just uh, improves people's quality of life. Mm -hmm. And that definitely goes with the theme of the film, Seacrest. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the movie? Yes, yes. Awesome. So, yeah, the movie, yes. It sounds exciting being it produced here. So do you remember the first day they were filming in here or were you involved directly with them? I was not uh, the main person coordinating with them, but um, certainly I remember I was a big part of the getting ready for them to come. The, the crew comes first for a couple of weeks and gets everything ready. Like they actually are... You know, they do construction in some of the rooms. They rebuild bits and pieces that they want to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. And then the um, most of our interaction was with the crew. Um, and then the filming um, started in a couple of weeks later. And um, certainly was um, it was just such an, an interesting and new experience for us. We'd never done anything like that before. And um, so interesting to see the finished product and see how the behind the scenes and, yeah. and the difference and how the editing works to piece it all together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was very interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what was the weather like? Because I heard um, it was kind of rainy during the shoot, but the scenes were supposed to be taking place during like a hot summer. Yeah, it was actually kind of funny because they kept um, having to reschedule the sh different sh shots and move things around. It's just constantly um, changing the schedule day by day. Um, because of the weather and then um, there is actually a rain scene in the in the show and they had to bring in a water truck and a rain machine to get the rain that they needed on that day because of course uh, Murphy's Law it's a, it never is raining when you need it to be raining <laughs> so yeah it was it was a bit challenging for them I'm sure with the weather mm. and how did it go with um, again with one of those challenges and like issues on set during production we never know how did it go when it comes to like helping them, um, the, the process that uh, it, does it take a lot of time and what, you, how many people are usually involved? What was behind the scenes? Well, we had two staff that were just dedicated to the film crew when they, once they were here and making sure like every day, like I say, there was, um, people arriving, people departing, um, what they needed access to and. Um, just making sure they had everything they needed. So um, it's definitely very hands-on and you have to have some dedicated resources to just be focused on that. Um, there was lots of, you know, maintenance, housekeeping, everybody had to be um, involved in getting ready and um, providing, you know, sometimes they just needed something. Oh, we need something today. And so you're kind of, you know, have to be willing to just uh, go with the flow. <laughs> as it's going along. <laughs> yeah. What What do you think is like the meaning? What does it mean to you to have this film on like on Gabriel Island? Well, I think it was. Um, I mean, great exposure for Gabriola for sure, um, and even just the West Coast and the scenery when in the finished product in the movie was beautiful. I mean, it was absolutely gorgeous, and the shots. I mean, it would make anybody want to come and visit the Gulf Islands. So. I think from that perspective, it was definitely, um, I think, an, uh, worth doing for the, you know, just the local exposure. Mm -hmm. um, for the Haven specifically, I mean, it did showcase that we're, we're here. They, they don't really say the Haven, obviously, in the movie, but, um, you know, I think it just gives people a sense of what's possible mm -hmm. when they visit, visit Gabriel Island. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there were lots of locals and background actors involved in the movie. How did it uh, impact it or benefit the community here? 
Well, I think that must have been just a thrill for all those people. There were lots of kids involved, which was really fun. Uh, lots of scenes with the kids. And I think there were even local people that helped on the crew. And even, I think, when they needed to get from point A to point B, there were all kinds of ways that, that the locals, local people could be involved, the local community. So I think that's just, you know, an added bonus when uh, we have something like that on the island. And I think, um, I mean, it was nice for us that people that maybe, maybe they knew about the Haven or didn't know about the Haven, and um, they came and had that experience here. So we, we're always welcoming and want the community to come and be a part of this place. It's a beautiful spot. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so since the movie's release to the public, has it benefit um, the Haven itself? Besides, you know, exposure, did you notice any other um, aspect? I haven't actually, I don't think so. So I would say not that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be interesting to see because it's just, you know, recently been released in the theaters. So maybe more people have seen it than would have seen it at the film festivals. But so we'll see. Maybe there'll be people that come this summer who saw the movie, you know, right. saw the movie now. And, and maybe that's yet to yet to come come to be. <laughs> there, there will be some, uh, you know, some kind of follow up from it. You know, do you have any expectations for maybe in the future again seeing like what the film the seagrass is doing right now what do you think is your expectation for a future what it could bring for the haven and like gabriel island well um i mean i would hope that it would you know there might be other film crews film industry in the people in the film industry i guess that um, might be interested in filming on gabriola or any of the gulf islands i mean i would think that's good for the economy so if you know if that comes again I think that it would be worth uh, exploring for sure mm -hmm. yeah so you would definitely recommend this place to like other people and visit visitors or filmmakers sure filmmakers visitors absolutely <laughs> we want everybody to come to Gabriola <laughs> it's beautiful here <laughs> and oh. to the Haven <laughs> and on a final note how, how do you feel seeing the Haven on the big screen where you would just um, were, did you bring anyone else with you Shelly and I went together. Shelly's the other co-manager here, my colleague here at the Haven. And um, we were just thrilled, to be honest. It was so fun to see the us knowing behind the scenes which buildings and rooms and how they pieced it all together because it's um, the editing is amazing. So it was just uh, thrilling, really, to see the Haven. And it was presented so beautifully on the big screen. So I, I was thrilled it was exciting <laughs> well yeah. we got approval right here yeah <laughs> <laughs> anyways once again thank you so much i appreciate you for being in this interview oh you're welcome you're welcome <laughs>